Thank you for joining us for this latest episode of Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. A major part of the mission of our TV show is to highlight archaeological discoveries from the ancient Near Eastern world that demonstrate the historical reliability of the Bible. There's literally thousands of discoveries that would fit this description that I've just given. But with that in mind, one question you might have is, is there any way we could identify the most important or perhaps the greatest archaeological discovery ever made related to the Bible? It's a very difficult task, it's kind of a fun task, but if we had to choose just one discovery, we would say that it would probably be the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, to help us better understand the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have someone joining us today, Dr. Craig Evans from Houston Baptist University in Texas, to tell us all about these fascinating artifacts discovered in Israel. Dr. Evans, welcome back to Digging for Truth. It's good to see you again. Good to be with you. Now, the last time we were together, we talked about uh, New Testament manuscripts and uh, the significance of those, and we hope to have you back again to talk about them because there's a lot to talk about. But today we're going to talk about primarily the Old Testament and particularly the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, we're going to jump right into it, so let's let's, uh, share with the audience what are the Dead Sea Scrolls to start with, where and when were they discovered, uh, and let's, uh, let's begin there. Well, in the modern times, the first discovery was made, we think, in 1947. I say modern times because we've learned since that it's possible some of the uh, caves near Qumran that contain manuscripts were discovered in antiquity because we actually have some ancient references to uh, scrolls with Hebrew characters coming to light near Jericho. But in modern times, we think it was 1947, uh, the Bedouin give us the story. Anyway, that's the traditional date. Yeah. And so Cave 1 was found. Of course, the caves get their numbers in order of their discovery. So from 1947 to 1956, 11 caves were found. We didn't know how many they were because so many of them were in fragments, and so the work has been ongoing. Today, the count is 900 and some, and you know I fudge a little bit when I say that because we really don't know precisely how many scrolls have been recovered from Qumran and other areas uh, in the Dead Sea region. And please understand, when we we say the Dead Sea scrolls, they weren't found in the Dead Sea. They were found in caves uh, to the west of the Dead Sea in these cliffs mostly, places like Nahal Hever and a few other places, but mostly at Qumran. And so it's something like just under 1,000 scrolls, and they were found in the 40s and 50s. Scholars have been studying them since. There was a great breakthrough in the 90s when a whole bunch of fragments finally began to be published. So just about all of them are out. There might be still a few fragments awaiting publication. Yeah, so we're talking about... uh... The count is over 900, you're saying, and, and the, when you add to fragments, we're talking about thousands and thousands of fragments. Is that correct? Yes, thousands of fragments, maybe 20,000 fragments. But the actual scroll count as discrete documents uh, is somewhere in the 900s. Yeah, it's, it's quite remarkable. Now, um, let's, we're going to talk about the dating and the location a little bit more in our next segment. But uh, I want to give the, the audience a, a taste here a little bit. Um, now, I've, I've looked at Dead Sea Scroll, read them. I've looked at the pictures of them online because they have them online now. You can, you can see just about uh, most of them if you want to study them or look at them just to, to, to uh, enjoy seeing these ancient artifacts. But you've, you've actually studied them yourself. Uh, your, your experience goes way, well beyond what I'm describing. Would you share with the audience a little bit about your, your personal experience as a scholar? Well, I had a, a, just a tremendous... Uh opportunity. Claremont had uh, relocated the School of Theology from the University of Southern California, so it came to Claremont, hence its name. And that was in the 1960s, and that that was just 15 minutes from where I grew up. And uh, Claremont was interested in the scrolls, and they had hired uh, William Brownlee in uh, 1959. And I should tell you, who's William Brownlee? William (laughs) Brownlee. He was, in, he was in Jerusalem in 1947-48, and he was there when the scrolls came to light, along with John Trevor. And so here are these two guys about 30 years old doing postdoctoral studies 
uh, in Jerusalem. They had gone there for different reasons. They just happened to be there when the scrolls came to light. John Trevor took those famous photographs of the great Isaiah scroll and a few of the other scrolls, and it changed their lives. They became cr scrolls experts from that point on. Well, here's what happened. This is where I get into it. 30 years later, I'm a doctoral student studying with uh, William Brownlee. So what a privilege. But in the 1970s, uh, the, the pace of publication of the scrolls had, had slowed to like a snail's pace, yes. and people were losing interest. There were people that were impatient, saying, why aren't the rest of them published? And people were moving on to other things. And I was not encouraged to go into scroll study, if you can believe that. Uh, but I decided to do that, and who would have known years later it, it exploded on the scene. So I was extremely privileged. I was in John Trevor's office. He showed me his original photographs that he had taken in Jerusalem. Uh, so there I was looking at these beautiful color photographs. There are pictures of him uh, unrolling the great Isaiah scroll in his dorm room. Uh, Bill Brownlee told me stories about the great Isaiah scroll at Duke University, uh -huh. where Bill went as a new appointment. And his Hebrew students were reading from the great Isaiah scroll in classroom. And so I was right there from the very beginning. I thought, you know, this is neat. This is important stuff. Yeah. And it really shaped my career. Yeah, that, that's tremendous. So um, I'll tell you what, we're going we're gonna to talk about the great Isaiah scroll in, in detail uh, in part two of our episode. Let's give uh, folks a taste a little bit. Just you have about a minute. Let's give them the date range of the scrolls. Give them an idea of how old these scrolls are. And then we'll talk about that importance in the next segment. Very good. We have a few scrolls that date to the 3rd century B.C. We have one, two, maybe three that could date as early as 300 B.C. Those are outliers. Most of the scrolls uh, are in the 1st century B.C. Uh, the Great Isaiah Scroll, perhaps 150 B.C. A few scrolls are in the beginning of the Common Era, or A.D., and the first few decades. But the bulk of them range about 50 B.C. to 100 B.C. Okay, fit between 50 and 100. And um, now this community of people that live there, we see an end to the, the scrolls as you get into the time of, of Christ and, of course, the destruction of the temple. Is that correct? Around then we see a complete end to the, the dates of the scrolls. That's right. Scholars uh, dispute when the community at Qumran was destroyed and then all interest and activity with the scrolls came to an end. Uh, it was either in the year 68, uh, when uh, the Roman legions uh, surrounded and captured Jericho, which was nearby, or it was in the year 73 later okay. when the Romans marched toward Masada. Okay, so that helps us to date them a little bit. We're going to talk about the dating uh, a little bit more in our next segment. So, folks, uh, we're just getting started with our talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls with Dr. Craig Evans, and we'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. The greatest archaeological discovery of all time? Probably the Dead Sea Scrolls. To talk about this amazing discovery, or discoveries, I should say, we're here with Dr. Craig Evans from Houston Baptist University to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls. In our last segment, we were discussing uh, a little bit about the dating of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Dr. Evans, I was wondering if you could give the audience a quick tutorial on, well, how do we date the scrolls? How do we know how these scrolls are 2,000 plus years old? How do we get a general idea of the fact that they are actually that age? There are two ways that we date things like this. There, the scrolls are written on leather, some of them papyrus. Either way, it's living material at one time. So carbon-14 dating is one way of dating them. The other way is just to look at the handwriting, handwriting typology. It's called paleography. And so we look at undated writing from antiquity and compare it to writing in documents that have dates. And then yes. we can compare them. And so both 
approaches to dating suggest that these scrolls are mostly in the first century BC. So that's how it's done. That's not controversial. Yes. And uh, we can add to that a little bit what they, they have found. They found coins at Qumran there and pottery. Is that, is that correct? So it kind of shows when they lived there and gives you an occupational profile of the site. That's right. And then you've got the archaeology that's been done at the site at Qumran, Kerbet Qumran, the, the Qumran ruins and uh, pottery. We actually have the kiln. We actually have the place where they made their own pots, their own uh, plates for food and so on. And so the style of pottery, the coins you mentioned, we found a coin hoard that had been uh, buried nearby, yes. and we could identify the coin. So everything points to a community that began sometime around 100 B.C. and then ended very violently and abruptly, as I said, either it's in 68 or 73 A.D., connected to the great Jewish rebellion that ended in the destruction of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Yes. Yes. Well, that's very good. Okay, so now let's move to uh, the content of the scrolls. Because a lot of people think that, uh, you know, it's just biblical scrolls that were found here, books, books of the Old Testament. But, uh, of course, we have that, but it goes beyond that. So uh, share with the audience the language that's been found and, and some of the content that's been discovered there. Uh, go ahead with that, please, if you would. Well, Henry, those are very good questions. Uh, people do need to know that... Uh, uh, of these, let us say, almost 1,000 scrolls, about 220, so we're talking 22, 23 percent, are Bible scrolls. And if we talk about the Old Testament as 39 books, uh, and that's usually how Christians count the books of the Old Testament, we have all of them except uh, the book of Esther. Yes. And Ezra and Nehemiah, you know, they were combined as one scroll. We have a piece of Ezra, so we assume Nehemiah uh, was there as well. So you have 38, basically. You could say 38 out of 39 books, but we have multiple copies. You, you, you're, you're, the people watching the program need to know there was no such thing as a Bible, a single book. There was no Old Testament that had everything together. Right. The biblical books were individual, and so we have multiple copies of Genesis, Deuteronomy, Psalms, and Isaiah, for example, and then in some cases just a fragment of one copy of a writing. So 22% scrolls uh, are Bible scrolls. What about the rest? Commentaries, calendars, uh, uh, interpretations of the law, uh, community rules about how they should live. Uh, visions, apocalyptic material about future events, uh, things like that as well. About 10% is in uh, Aramaic, uh, most of it's Hebrew, and then just a few, about two dozen fragmentary documents from Cave 7 are uh -huh. in Greek. In Greek, and so, so we have a wide variety of texts. So in some of these uh, non-biblical uh, documents, you talk about commentaries and stuff, Talk a little bit just generally about uh, how that gives us insight as to how this particular community understood and exegeted the Old Testament text. Maybe you could reflect on that a little bit. Well, this community was extremely concerned about the law being obeyed correctly, especially as it related to the priesthood. And that seems to be the flashpoint with this group. They broke from the uh, probably the Hasmonean uh, priestly families uh, in Jerusalem around 100 B.C., maybe a little earlier, and they established this community out in the wilderness, and part of their task was to interpret Scripture and understand it correctly because they envisioned in the future establishing a pure priesthood, yes. true descendants of the, son, you know, the sons of Zadok, the high priest that goes back to the time of Solomon. And they believed that the Jerusalem... Uh, priesthood was corrupt, wasn't uh, obeying the law correctly uh, in matters of purity, in relations to Gentiles and things like that, and they anticipated that God would raise up a Messiah someday who would vindicate them and establish a new pure priesthood in Jerusalem, and that's when the Romans and the Gentiles would all be defeated and Israel would, would have a whole new lease on life. Yeah, it's quite remarkable to see that, not only their understanding of Scripture, but then the rules of their community, and, the, and maybe, maybe you could comment a little bit about the war scroll, because I find that fascinating, their, their whole 
understanding of that the contempt for the Jerusalem priesthood and their own view of themselves as being sort of God's chosen people. Maybe you could comment on that a little bit. Yeah, the war scroll from Qumran, and there are fragments of copies of it from other caves as well, but the war scroll uh, is extremely important because it anticipates a great battle between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. And on the side of the sons of darkness are evil spirits, and on the side of the sons of light, which of course would be the Qumran community and faithful Jews, would be angels. And so it's an interesting thing of flesh and spirit marching in lockstep in mortal combat. And they would win, and the Romans would be just massacred, yes. and the ruling priests would have to, you know, the big crisis would be, what do you do with all these dead bodies lying around on the ground that would pollute the Holy Land? So that was a big deal. In a fragment from, from Qumran's fourth cave, we think it's related to the uh, war scroll. It actually talks about the Messiah going head to head with the Roman emperor and defeating him, killing him. So that gives us a good idea of what the men at Qumran anticipated in the near future. Yeah, that, that's really, it's really a fascinating picture. It also gives us a little bit, we're going to talk about in our next episode a little bit more, a little bit of a background on understanding this messianic expectation in Israel, and that we see that in the New Testament. But we're going to hold off on that. I'm just going to tease that for the audience. We're going to, we're, I'm going to let you talk about that in our next episode as well. So we're going to uh, finish up this segment now, folks. Please don't go away. Um, we'll be right back with Dr. Craig Evans talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research, written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint. Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host Henry Smith and I'm here with Dr. Craig Evans talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now in our last segment we were talking about some of the extra biblical material that the, the people at Qumran had written uh, reflecting on their beliefs about the Old Testament, the Messiah, and uh, the wickedness of the Jerusalem priesthood and the, and the Romans and so on. But we're going to focus our attention now, uh, Dr. Evans, a little bit on the biblical material. And so uh, I thought maybe it would be instructive to give an overview of, of some of the, the content of the canonical scriptures that we know as the Old Testament, uh, the volume of them, and the significance of the different books, such as Genesis and so on. So uh, go ahead with that, if you would, please. Well, I said in an earlier segment that there isn't a Bible in the sense that there's a single book with all of the books in it. Uh, what You have individual scrolls of biblical books. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Uh, they have multiple copies. They have many, many copies of Deuteronomy. And that's clearly the most popular book of the books of Moses. They have many copies of Isaiah. And that's an indication that Isaiah was very important to the men of Qumran. And then they have multiple copies of the Psalter. And uh, why multiple copies? Well, if you have lots of people studying these books, Isaiah, Deuteronomy, and Psalms, you'd need multiple copies. If you have almost no one studying the book of, say, Chronicles, then yeah. one copy's enough. And so that gives us an indication. And sure enough, there's a correlation when you look at the scriptures that are quoted in the non-biblical books, the books that we talked about in the earlier segment, like the War Scroll or the Commentaries and some of the other writings. Well, guess what? Deuteronomy is the one that gets quoted the most. Isaiah gets quoted the most of the prophets, the Psalter. Yeah, and then you look at the New Testament, and guess what? It's the same correlation. If, if you look at a, an index that notes how, how often Old Testament scriptures are quoted in the New Testament books, You'll notice again, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, and the Psalter are the big winners. 
And so this tells us, huh, you know, there are certain books that drew a lot of attention. And it, I think it underscores how Christianity itself, very much as a Jewish movement of revival and messianism in the matrix of first century Judaism. And there's this correlation uh, in a broad sense that we see uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah, it's, it's uh, really quite fascinating. Um, you know, it, it's sort of a... It, it, it's interesting, the law, one book, the prophets, another, and the Psalms, the third, sort of the, the threefold division that Jesus talked about, we find are the three most popular uh, texts from those different categories at Qumran. It's really fascinating. Yeah, it, it really is, because uh, that's hugely important. If the Christian movement is going to get off the ground in the context of Judaism, they have to show that this Jesus who came and ministered and then scandalously was crucified by the Romans. Even if you talk about resurrection, which is wonderful. I mean, after all, Pharisees believed in a resurrection. Right. But the scandal was if Jesus is the Messiah, if he really is the Son of God, if he is going to be Israel's Savior, how do you explain his crucifixion. Yes. And that's a major debate that goes right on into the second century. Justin Martyr, the church father, in his dialogue with Trifo the Jew, has to explain that. And so appealing to the scriptures for their prophetic witness to show that Jesus' ministry and his death and resurrection are in step with scripture is vital to show. Yeah, it's really it's really interesting. You know, you you talked earlier about uh, a messianic figure that the folks at Qumran envisioned uh, confronting the emperor is is, uh, is is what you you had mentioned, right? So there's a shadow uh, of what they've drawn out of the text that's there that we would agree with. That an ex from a Christian standpoint, there's this expectation there's going to be a confrontation with wickedness. But it comes in a different way in the New Testament. It's done differently. And God has a different plan. But the idea is there in its kernel. I, I find that very fascinating. Well, the big difference between Christianity and Qumran, ultimately, and Paul gives great uh, you know, articulation of this in his letters, the big difference is, is that Christians recognize that the Messiah had to die for the sins of humanity. That's how he really saves us. Killing yes. the Roman emperor doesn't save anybody. And Qumran hasn't, didn't get that memo. And so Qumran believed that the only way Israel and the world could be saved would be in a violent confrontation with Rome, kill the Roman emperor. Well, that did not work out. Jerusalem was smashed. The, the Jerusalem temple was destroyed. And the Qumran community came to an end. Christianity then flourished. Yes. And after 300 years, captured the Roman empire without any violence. Now this, uh, the, yeah, it is a, a contrast. So they had they had a kernel right, but they had the whole the whole picture wrong, you know, the big picture of what what the Messiah was to be. Now, if I recall correctly, um, there were some multiple views of the Messiah. Why don't we talk about that since we're talking about messianic views? Uh, you know that there would be a, a sort of a kingly f uh, f uh, figure and so on. What do we find in the scrolls about uh, about messianic uh, figures, as it were? Well, in, in the scrolls, and of course, it is a library now. If we talk about all of the Dead Sea Scrolls, they weren't all written by the men of Qumran. Obviously, they weren't the authors of the biblical books. Right. Uh, they wrote. They we call them sectarian. The, the writings they themselves wrote, but they collected writings. But the picture of the Messiah that we get is he's militant, he's like uh, King David, he's going to lead armies. The distinctive flavor uh, at Qumran is that he agrees, this Messiah will agree with their understanding of the priesthood, their understanding of the law, and will support them. Indeed, it seems like he, he's almost subordinate uh, to the Qumran high priest. But otherwise, he's very typical of the militant Messiah that many Jewish people wanted uh, in the first century B.C. and the first century A.D., a Messiah who would lead the armies of Israel in victory against Gentiles, especially the hated Romans. Yes. Well, I think that's a, that's a good way to end the program, Dr. Evans. We're going to pick up in part two, of course, to talk more about the Dead Sea Scrolls because there's so much to cover. But I think the thing to share with the audience here at the end is to say that this Jesus who humbled himself came into the world and died the scandalous death 
will return as a conquering king someday, uh, just in a way that the Qumran community and most Jews of that time didn't expect. And we, we revel in the glory of the fact that Jesus died for us and that he is our king and he will come as a king, not as a baby in a manger. Folks, thank you for joining us today on Digging for Truth. Join us for our next episode with Dr. Evans as we talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls.